I try to lock her out. <laughs> Mayor, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm here. I'm sorry. I had to help a citizen get uh, on the phone for the call. Sorry about that. But I'm ready now. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll recall the uh, city council meeting for August the 17th, 2020. And I will give the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be followed by the invitation by Vice Mayor and Council Member Melinda Moose. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Father, let us pray. We pray that you watch over us during these unsettling of times. We ask that you bless those who have died or are sick and those who are suffering. We pray that you watch over all in law enforcement, fire and rescue, first responders, and all those essential workers that are on the front lines. Father, we pray that you guide us all to be respectful and kind, no matter what our opinions may be. We pray that you watch over our armed forces, that they may return safely to their families. In your name we pray, amen. 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 Ms. Sykes, please call the roll, please. Mr. Green? Here. Mr. Hill? Here. Mr. Jefferson? Here. Ms. Moses? Here. Mayor Witt? Here. Mr. Coberline? Here. Mr. Huffenberger? Here. Chief Gilmore? Here. Okay, we don't have minutes from the last uh, special meeting, but we did have a memorandum of uh, uh, regarding the uh, action we took. Uh, do we need a motion on that or just that for informational purposes? That was just for information purposes only, Mayor. Okay. Uh, next is approval of the agenda. I'm I'm to approve the agenda as published, Mayor. Second. And a motion second to approve the agenda as published. Ms. Sykes, we follow the roll. Mr. Jefferson? Yes. Ms. Moses? Yes. Mr. Hill? Yes. Mr. Green? Yes. Mayor Witt? Yes. Okay, uh, this time we're going to have a presentation from Mrs. Lauren Yader, AICP Senior Planner, North Central Florida Regional Planning Council. Is she there? Hi, yes, I'm here. Good evening. I'm, I'm okay. Lauren Yetter. Um, I'm a senior planner at the North Central Florida Regional Planning Council. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to present this information about the Small Cities uh, Community Development Block Grant Program for this first public hearing. Um, the purpose of the first public hearing really is to discuss potential projects to submit to the state for consideration. Um, let me see if I can try to share my screen. Okay, I think that's it. All right, so um, I'll, I'll go over a brief overview of the CDBG program. Um, the overview includes a little bit of history, um, the purpose, national objectives, eligible applicants, uh, types of assistance, administering agencies, uh, benefits, uh, displacement, program categories, eligible activities, grant ceilings, um, scoring system, and then submission periods for this grant cycle, um, submission deadlines, and uh, what, what projects were awarded last year. So just a little bit his of history about the CDBG program. Um, the uh, Community Development Block Grant Program, or the CDBG program, is the federal program that provides funding for housing and community development activities. Uh, Congress created the program when it passed the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974. Um, and then in Florida, the, small, the Florida Small Cities Community Development Block Grant Program Act was passed in 1983. Um, it's a very competitive grant program that awards funds to units of local governments in small, urban, and rural areas. Uh, Florida actually receives between 18 and $26 million annually from HUD, 
uh, to award subgrants to eligible units of local government. And the purpose is to undertake community development activities um, to arrest and reverse community decline and restore community vitality um, by providing decent housing, a suitable living environment, uh, principally for low and moderate income persons. Um, to be eligible for funding, an activity must meet at least one of these following national objectives. Um, the first is to benefit uh, low and moderate income persons. At least 51% of the beneficiaries must be low and moderate income persons. The total household income is at or below 80% of the area's median income. Um, the second national objective is elimination of slum and blight. Um, to eliminate conditions of slum and blight as defined by state law and identified by the unit of local government on a spot or area basis. Um, and the third national objective is to address urgent needs. Um, eligible applicants include cities with populations of under 50,000 um, and counties with populations of under 200,000. Um, different types of assist assistance include the grant, these grants on a competitive basis um, and matching funds really aren't required, um, but in the application process, as you'll see later on in, the, in this presentation, um, matching funds do score extra points. Um, the program is administered by, administered by the United States Depart Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. Um, the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, the DEO, administers the state program in Florida through this grant program, through the Small Cities CDBG program. Um, so at least 70% of funds spent on activities must benefit low and moderate income persons, and at least 51% of low and moderate income persons must receive the benefit. Um, of course, the goal is also to minim minimize displacement of persons and um, to provide assistance to displaced persons if, if there is displacement. Um, so in the CDBG program, there are several categories, four categories, um, housing, neighborhood revitalization, uh, commercial revitalization, and economic development. Um, these numbers are actually from fiscal year 18. Um, we don't know exactly just yet, we'll know this week what fiscal year 19, the, the current cycle, um, what the breakdown of you know, the different allocated funds are for the different categories. But last year, fiscal year 18, housing had $6.27 million, neighborhood revitalization was 9.63 million, um, commercial revitalization was 1.66 million, and then economic development was 7.53 million for a total of $25.09 million um, for fiscal year 18 available funds. Um, so different eligible activities in the housing category include rehabilitation of substandard housing um, and also demolition of dilapidated housing. Um, in the category of neighborhood revitalization, uh, activities include water and sewer facilities, uh, street improvements, drainage improvements, neighborhood facilities, and planning and design. In the commercial revitalization category, eligible activities include streetscape improvements, commercial building facade improvements. And in the economic development category, um, eligible activities include public facility improvements and subordinated business loans. Um, so uh, for this, for the CWG grant, the grant ceilings are as follows for um, they're actually based on low and moderate income population within the applicant's uh, jurisdiction. Um, so if you have a population of one to 499 people who are low and moderate income population, then you can apply for si up to 600,000. Um, if you have 500 to 1250, you can apply for up to 650,000. Um, and actually these, these different categories are for housing, neighborhood, or vital neighborhood and also um, commercial but economic development has a ceiling of $1.5 million. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about, about the scoring system. Um, these are all the different categories that are included in, in the total score of 1,000 points, 1,000 possible points per application. Um, so one category is a community-wide need score. That's 250 points. I'll go over this a little, in a little bit more detail um, in the next few slides. Um, then the next uh, category is program impact, and um, there's a total available 505 points. Um, outstanding performance of equal opportunity employment and promoting fair housing, you, you can score up to 90 points. And then there are sort of a, other categories um, for a total of 150 points within that category. And um, all those categories combined uh, is a total of 1,000 points per application, a total possible 
uh, points of a thousand points per application. Um, so if we look at the community wide need score um, category within the application, um, it's based on census data. You can score up to 250 points. Um, and this number is actually really it's um, already sort of predetermined by the department by, by the state. Um, they base it on uh, census data and each um, eligible community um, has their own score. So when I took a look at fiscal year 2018 scores for Lake City, um, it's based on the 2010 census and um, the community-wide need score was 70.54 points out of a total of 250 points. Now, this number might have changed. Um, uh, we'll know a little bit more this week once we go through some workshops for, from the department. Um, and so hopefully that score might be a little bit higher to, to score a little extra points for the city. Um, so in the next category for the scoring system, there's program impact. And um, there's a total of 505 points and there's sort of a breakdown of what goes into that 505 points. Um, there's activity goals, you can score up to 110. Um, the percent of low and moderate income persons in the service area, um, you can score up to 155 points. Um, a cost benefit, 115 points. Um, readiness to proceed, that's if there's a shovel ready project and there are plans and specs or plans and specifications in place, you can get an extra 50 points. And then um, health and safety impact, um, another 75 points. And then in the next category, the equal opportunity and fair housing, you can score up to 90 points. And um, those, that, that breakdown is as follows. Uh, the racial composition of city uh, commissioner, city council employees, um, 60 points. Past grant minority contracting or minority and women business owned uh, um, contracting, 20 points. And then if the applicant, if the city has a fair housing ordinance, and if they've had a fair housing workshop within the last few months, you can get an extra 10 points. Um, and then sort of a, catch all for the other categories, you can score up to 155 points if um, the applicant is in a special um, designated area, which um, Lake City actually is um, in an RAO or a rural area of opportunity. So you get an extra 20 points there. Um, grant history score, you get an extra 100 points if you haven't had an open CDBG grant within the last five years. Um, and then an extra 10 points if you have, uh, the applicant has a citizen advisory task force or CATF. And then an extra 25 points um, if the applicant commits to um, matching funds or leverage. Um, so for this fiscal year cycle, a fiscal year 2019 application cycle, um, for all of these cate categories just described, um, the application cycle actually opens on August 19th, 2020. It, it closes um, 5 p.m. October 5th. But actually one exception to this is the economic development category. Um, so for housing, neighborhood revitalization, and commercial revitalization, those applications would be due by October 5th, 2020, um, which is right around the corner. But um, if an applicant submits a, an economic development application, that's on a first come first serve basis, because there's a little more flexibility, um, there's more time to submit that application. Um, and so only one grant can be open at a time except for economic de development. You can have two economic development um, grants open at, at one time. Um, and only one application can be submitted if it's a housing, neighborhood, or commercial revitalization application. Um, so if we take a look at some of the numbers from last year, um, in the housing category, there were seven applications. All seven were funded. Uh, for a total of $5 million awarded. In neighborhood revital revitalization, there were 16 applications, all 16 were funded, and that meant a $10.65 $10. $10. million um, awarded. And then in commercial revitalization, there was only one application, so it was funded, and that was a $650,000 grant. And then economic development, there were actually seven applications, all seven were funded, and um, the total awards were $7.54 million. Um, I will say that last year was sort of an anomaly. Um, you know, in any given grant cycle, you don't know how many, how many applicants are gonna be. You don't know, you know, what 
what kind of applications are going to be submitted, what kind of projects will be submitted. Um, last year, I think because grant cycles were so close to each other, there weren't as many applicants, which is unusual. Um, so in essence, anyone who applied was awarded last grant cycle. But um, you know, we're not really sure if that'll happen again. Um, so generally, uh, the CDBG program is very, very competitive. Um, like I said, last year was a little bit of an anomaly. Um, usually it's, there are many, many more applicants than there is funding available. Um, and so here's also a list of the different grants, uh, CDBG grants that were obtained for the city of Lake City by the Regional Planning Council um, with a total of $10.45 million. And that's it for my presentation. Um, so as I said, the first public hearing is, is really sort of a general information about the CDBG program um, and about the, the upcoming cycle, the upcoming grant application cycle. Um, and the first public hearing, the intention is for um, applicants, in, case, in this case, the city of Lake City, um, to discuss different projects that might, um, you know, that might be submitted to the state and, um, and then to, to hear any public comment for, for any, any applicant or any projects that might be submitted. Yeah, I have a, I have a question. Um, where where does um, do a family go to apply for a CDB grant? Um, a, a family like for, for for housing specifically? Yes. So if a community is awarded a housing rehabilitation grant, um, then like for example, um, let's say uh, Columbia County um, was awarded a, a housing re rehabilitation grant. Um, they'll have a separate application process for, um, for residents of Columbia County that are in the unincorporated area who are interested in rehabilitating their home. Um, so a lot, of, a, lot of, um, a lot of communities have like a, a SHIP office, um, a state housing initiative program uh, office that works hand in hand with, with the state. Um, and they'll have an application process um, for for residents. Uh, well, reason why I asked that question, I had a lady um, several months ago ask me about the uh, uh, CDB grant uh, mm -hmm. program, and I I hadn't really got back with her, but now I got something to, to take back to her on um, with some of the process that she needed to do to try to apply for some housing assistance. This this number here, this this three five two number, is that a good number for you know to give her to to call someone to talk with them? Um, yes, we, we could we could answer some questions. Um, does the does the city have a? The city doesn't have a ship office, right? Maybe no, we Columbia do not. County. Columbia, Columbia County. County might? The county does. The county yes. does. Okay, that that actually might be a good place to start. Is okay. the ship office um, within Columbia County? Uh, because they, they also have access to, to other funds outside of just CDBG. And we, uh, it was, used to be a lady that, that worked for the city. She was real good about getting these grants for, for low income houses. And, uh, but she's no longer with the city. Uh, but she, she's still kind of active with, with trying to get these grants. So it's, it is, and it's also a good program. Matter of fact, my, my mom, she, she benefited from it. Yeah, it's, it's a great program. Uh, one thing to remember though, is that, um, you know, for the three categories for housing, neighborhood and commercial revitalization, um, during an open grant cycle um, or an application cycle, you can only apply for, a community can only apply for one of those three. Um, and then economic development, that category is, is is the exception you can apply a community can apply for an economic development grant and a neighborhood or a housing um, or commercial grant at the same time well, that's all i have okay anybody have any questions to lauren okay lauren i want to thank you for uh, your presentation uh we're to take public comments but we're at the stage where we're at persons wishing to address council so i guess we could kind of combine that and see who wants to speak uh 
Maybe how many people do we have want to speak? Do you have a... Um, so far we have three. So if people on the line press your raise hand button if you want to speak. If you're on the phone, dial star nine. And so we're going to start with Bruce Borders. In just a second. And everybody get their name and address, please, for the clerk. If you hear us, go ahead and unmute. Kind of, how do they unmute? Tell me to hit star line. There it is. Just raises your hand. First orders, if you hear us, unmute. Are you there? Are you there? Yep. Mayor Witt? Yes, sir. You can hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, my name is Bruce Borders. I go back eight generations local. You know, around Brantford, Florida, Hatch Bend, we still have the farm. And, um, the reason I'm calling today, I've been doing a lot, a lot of homework. And when the um, courthouse was built, the county courthouse was built, the, um, the, <clears throat> the state and the county was involved in it, and the monument was put in there, and it was turned over to the county. The county still owns the property the statue's sitting on. It's got a marker there saying that you cannot move or disturb any area around it. And uh, going from there, I can't understand what a piece of rock is hurting anybody. Now, uh, you know, I take my word there. When the Battle of Velocity started two weeks before the Battle of Velocity, the Union soldiers sent out scouts out of Jacksonville. They got to 190, and they said, this is out of the Union book now, not out of the Confederate book, the Union book, that they were met by black Confederates on cannons. Do you hear what I just said? Black Confederates on cannons. Well, looking at the statistics, you know, I take my word, there was more black Confederates in the war than there was black Union soldiers. Don't have to take my word, you can verify. Okay? Now, like I say, the county still owns that. I've got it documented and everything. And the only way that they can do away with the statue if the county decides to put it on the ballot in the county residents folks if they want it or they don't want it so there's a lot of great people there like people like dr nelson wimbush he started out as a teacher went to be a pastor for 12 years he was superintendent of schools in seminole county his grandfather rode on the right hand side of nathan bedford forest not as a slave not not as a, a cook not as uh, came a clothes person. He was a soldier. And, and Nathan Bedford Forrest left without him. And about three hours later, he showed up and said, I'm going with you. And uh, then they had people like my wife's family <laughs> fired the first shot in South Carolina. First shot in South Carolina. And, um, and anyway, it was private first class Milton. I mean, um, first class um, Farley, which was her cousin, Farley. And then his brother wrote on the right-hand side, 
of uh, General Jeb Stewart, and he was killed at um, at a battle up in Virginia, and it was uh, caught in the bloodiest battle in the history of all wars. But um, anyway, my family did not own not one slave. I'm not prejudiced or nothing like that. And uh, Mr. Mayor and everybody there, I probably got more black friends than y'all do. I've got the only black unit in the United States. It's called the Randolph Milton Colored Black Light Artillery. And there's about 40 of them. And um, now we're down to about about 25 now. Some's died and passed on and all that. But uh, we're not out to do no races. But you're taking our monuments from us. You're taking taking our flags from us. And all what what we're not, we're not going to do this, or I'm not I'm not going to do it. But what if I called you up and I said, well, I want all the Martin Luther King signs taken down, all the monuments, all Rosa Park monuments down, all Rosa Park sign. Take them down. Mr. Ward, yeah, you have 30 uh, seconds left. Okay, I'm about three. So um, all I'm asking, and uh, Robert E. Lee and uh, Stonewall Jackson, Jeb Stewart, Nathan Beverly Forrest, they all sent money for black kids to have school, to be educated. Every one of them sent money to them. And about eight months ago, they busted out the windows in Virginia in a church, and the black members come up there, stood up with their guns, and said they would shoot them, that he was a real man of God. So, hey, all we're asking to do our, do our living history, keep our heritage going, and um, you might take our, our flag from us, you might take our monument from us, but there's one thing about it. You can't take my ancestors out of my out of my uh, uh, out of my heart. Y'all have a good day, and we'll wait and see. And if y'all want to get lawyers, we'll get lawyers too. So uh, y'all have a good day, right, and uh, I work on. Okay, Mayor, he's been muted. Okay. Okay, next we have um, Glennell Bowden. Bowden? Glennell Bowden. Mr. Mayor, you hear me? I can. Oh, thank you so much. And, and I, I raised my hand because I, I, I saw where um, at the beginning of the meeting that uh, the uh, city clerk uh, did a memorandum uh, just saying that there was no minutes available, but she uh, advertise or promote it, how the vote went down. I guess my question is this, Mr. Mayor, and I appreciate uh, the courtesy that you and the city council expended to the community uh, last week and even tonight. And so I'm not calling uh, talk about the monument, but I, I got an issue I need to understand and maybe the, uh, the city clerk or the city attorney or uh, IT people can Tell me what this is about. If, as a citizen, uh, I understand that it's not going to be in a verbatim copies of minutes. I, I get that. It never should be. It's too time consuming, and I understand that. However, since we're going virtual now, and the taxpayers are paying for a Zoom meeting that's being uh, recorded, I would think, if in fact, uh, and this is a question for the three of them. If in fact I requested a public record request of the meeting, rather the last special meeting in the meetings of the recording that taxpayers are paying for via the Zoom, is that available? And if not, tell me why. Yes, it is. Mr. Bowden, I can send that to you tomorrow if you so desire. No, I'm, I just need to hear yes or no. Okay. Yes, sir. It is available. As long as there's not any issues with the recording, then absolutely it is available for public record. 
Yeah, and I'm not talking about the special meeting. I'm just talking about the meetings going forward, period. Yes, okay. Yes, they are available. Good answer. Thank you. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have a call-in user. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hey, Sylvester Warren, um, I would like to, uh, I'm sorry, um, 845 Northeast Richardson Terrace, uh, Lake City, Florida. Um, in light of so much uh, that's going on. Um, I think most of us are aware of the local police brutality, uh, lack of transparency that's taking place amongst law enforcement. It's causing a lot of distrust uh, with the community, in particular the black community and the community of color. Um, I have a few things that I would like to say and hope that the council and yourself will entertain and take up and help Lake City um, unlike other cities, get it right to look at policies and change policy that uh, promote transparency, uh, policies that help to uh, regain the trust of the community as it relates to law enforcement uh, in these different communities. Um, I sent the email to Mr. Heffenberg. I know it was a little past time to get on the agenda, but uh, I'm personally asking uh, the council to call for defunding the police department Please hear me out. I'm not talking about the liberal and radical version. This is not to gut the police department budget. It is not to eliminate police departments or strip agency of all their money. For myself and many others, it is about reprioritizing the police budget to include things such as social services, which would include mental health, addiction, and homelessness, uh, youth initiatives, uh, community policing, and a citizen review board. Also, I think it's important to get tracking data. Uh, in the black community, we experience too much of stop bar uh, violations and window tinting that too often leads to profiling and harassing of blacks who live in predominantly black communities. Too often people of color are stopped for these traffic violations and they turn into canines being called and cars being searched. I've had a meeting with the chief and the city manager months ago about this. Uh, nothing in return or no response to these issues. Uh, tracking data will help us to get it right with all citizens, no matter where they live or skin color. Uh, another issue that I think that needs to be looked at uh, that's very, very important to us would be the body cam policy that the police department has. It allows a uh, lack of transparency in which there's a workaround for police officers to mute their mic when they claim they're talking to other officers while on a traffic stop or to a supervisor. I can't imagine anything uh, being so important uh, that they would want to mute their mics, uh, especially to send as much transparency to uh, the community and as much trust to the community as possible. Um, I think uh, Florida Statute 119.07 uh, is already on the books to help out with that particular issue. Um, lastly, uh, I would say um, a few things. Uh, one, there's a study uh, using over six years of data found that an increase in funding police did not significantly relate to the decrease in crime. Throwing more police on the streets to solve a structural problem is one of the reasons why people are protesting in the streets. Defunding police, reallocating funds away from police departments to other sectors of government may be more beneficial for reducing crime and police violence. Uh, this is the Brooklyn Institution. And that's all I have to say and hope that uh, these issues uh, this council will take up um, and we can begin to do something about these issues uh, so that we don't uh, have like other towns uh, protesting in our streets. Um, thank you. Thank you. That's for the people that have raised their hands, but um, Ms. Yetter had more comments she wanted to make. Sure. Hi, thank you. Um, if, if there aren't any other uh, specific projects um, that the public or, or um, anyone else wants to discuss for the CDBG application, um, the council staff, we've been in, in talks with uh, city staff, um, and I know there is a particular CDBG project of interest, an economic development project, um, with uh, working with 
Columbia County and with HACO. Um, and so what I'd be interested in or what, what we're looking for is direction from um, the city council to uh, allow uh, regional planning council staff to work with uh, city staff in developing an economic development CDBG grant application. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for a raised hands. Mayor, do we need to close the public hearing? Yes. We'll close the public hearing since there's no more hands raised. And we'll move into uh, approval of the consent agenda. So moved. Second. second. And a motion and a second. Uh, I do want to say that I, I do appreciate what uh, the Rotary Club of Lake City has done for the uh, park uh, with the additional playground equipment. They've done quite a bit over there to help us out. Uh, Ms. Sykes, we call the roll. Moses? Yes. Mr. Jefferson? Yes. Hill? Yes. Green? Yes. Mayor Witt? Yes. Okay, we have no old business under new business. We have ordinance number 2020-2162 on first reading. Mr. Kerberline, would you read that by title? An ordinance of the City of Lake City, Florida, amending the future land use plan map of the City of Lake City comprehensive plan as amended, relating to an amendment of more than 10 acres of land pursuant to an application CPA 20-05 by the property owner of said acreage under the amendment procedures established in sections 163.3161 through 163.3248 for the statutes as amended, providing for changing the future and use classification from County Agricultural 3 and County Light Industrial to City Industrial, certain lands within the corporate limits of the City of Lake City, Florida, providing severability, repealing all ordinances in conflict, and providing an effective date period. Okay, we're moving to adoption of ordinance 2020-2162, first reading. Mr. Mayor, I move for approval of ordinance number 2020 2162 on the first read. Second. And a motion and a second. Any discussion? Ms. Sykes, will you call the roll? Mr. Jefferson? Yes. Ms. Moses? Yes. Mr. Hill? Yes. Mr. Green? Yes. Mayor Witt? Yes. Next is Ordinance 2020 2163 on first read. Mr. Kerberline, you read that by title. An ordinance of the City of Lake City, Florida, amending the official zoning atlas of the City of Lake City land development regulations as amended, relating to the rezoning of 10 or more contiguous acres of land pursuant to an application Z-20-06 by the property owner of said acreage, providing for rezoning from County Agricultural 3 and County Industrial Light and Warehousing to City Industrial Light and Warehousing of certain lands within corporate limits of the City of Wake City, Florida, providing severability, repealing all ordinances in conflict, and providing an effective date period. Okay, we'll move into adoption of ordinance number 2020-2163 on first reading. Mr. Mayor, I would move for the adoption of ordinance 2020-2163. Second. Second. a motion and a second, any discussion? Ms. Sykes, will you call the roll? Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Hill? Yes. Mr. Jefferson? Yes. Ms. Moses? Yes. Mayor Witt? Yes. Okay, next uh, we have ordinance number 2020-2164 on first reading. Mr. Kerberon, do you read my title? An ordinance of the City Council of City of Lake City, Florida, repealing ordinance 2016-2081 providing severability, providing for codification, and providing an effective date, period. Okay, we'll move into adoption of ordinance 2020-2164. Is there a motion? Mayor, I move for the approval of ordinance number 2020-2164. Second. Second. And a motion and a second, any discussion? Ms. Sykes, you call the roll. Mr. Jefferson? Yes. Moses? Yes. Mr. Hill? Yes. Mr. Green? Yes. 
Mayor Witt. Yes. Uh, next, we're to open a public hearing on the from the public regarding the sale of surplus property, Brandon Brent water system. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody wanting to speak on that. That Mandy, can you tell us anybody raised their hand to speak on this? If anybody wishes to speak, please raise your hand in the software or press star nine on the phone. There doesn't appear to be anybody. Okay, we'll close the hearing and move into City Council Resolution 2020-071. Mr. Governor, did you read that by title? The resolution of City Council of City of Wake City, Florida, authorizing the sale of the Brandon Brent water system, a city owned utility, pursuant to and in accordance with the provisions and requirements of section 180 301 Florida statutes and section 2 183 of the Code of the City of Wake City, Florida. Two Florida Utility Services, numeral one LLC, at a price of $70,800.00. Is there a motion at the City Council Resolution number 2020-071? Mr. Mayor, I would move for the adoption of Resolution 2020-071. Second. Been a motion and a second. Any discussion? Ms. Sykes, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Green? Yes. Ms. Moses? Yes. Mr. Jefferson? Yes. Mr. Hill? Yes. Mayor Witt? Yes. Next is City Council Resolution number 2020-061. Mr. Kerberlein, would you read that by title? Just a moment, Mayor, please. Okay. A resolution of City Council of City of Wake City, Florida, authorizing the city to enter into a partial settlement agreement relating to the redevelopment of the proper property located in block 14 of the central division of the city, also known as the Blanche. With Blanche Hotel Redevelopment LLC and Integrity Development Partners LLC and Blanche Master Tenant LLC and IDP Blanche Manager LLC and Blanche Financial Corporation Incorporated, period. Is there a motion at City Council Resolution 2020-061? Move Mr. For the Mayor. Go ahead. Mr. Mayor, I move for the adoption of Resolution 2020-061. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Ms. Sox, we call the roll. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I got a question. <clears throat> what is this? What, what kind of agreement is this? Sure. sure, this is a settlement agreement for the construction completion guarantee. Uh, there was a, uh, a delay in uh, completing the project on time. It was shown that there was about 5.6% not complete, and it was uh, a little over a month delay. Uh, it was a negotiation to settle this uh, delay at $75,909.44. Is based on square footage in the amount of time. Uh, also, it, it dealt with liens, and uh, our city attorney can talk about that if you'd like more detail. But essentially, uh, the city is this is a partial settlement for for the the issue of the liens that uh, there is no uh, the liens will not come back upon the city later on. Uh, the local People have been contacted and they, uh, they are uh, okay with the agreement uh, after talking with, with them. Uh, if you'd like more detail on the lien legality, I'd ask the city attorney, but this is, uh, I think, a fair settlement for, uh, for going forward. Uh, the, uh, the risk of litigation would be very uh, risky, I believe, because last time we did this, we... Uh, Taxpayers footed about seven hundred thousand in uh, legal fees, and uh, they uh, they had a significant amount of staff time it was redirected, and the city was not able to recoup almost all those funds. Uh, we do have a rent advance and refund agreement in place for four million dollars. There are provisions to get the money back over three different possibilities. If we would. Uh, have a significant number of uh, 
events in the event space. Uh, there's a possibility we would, would be able to make a profit off of our investment in, in that uh, in the four million dollars over the ten years. Uh, it will also serve as an anchor to get other uh, tax based growth in the downtown that you would otherwise not see. Uh, right now, the, the Blanche has all but one property of the res residential is occupied. There is four retail that, that are committed. Uh, and there are several offices that are at commitment or near it. Uh, the event space though is what can really uh, help uh, make the city money over the long term and maybe a profit uh, if we have enough events. Okay, anything else? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have a yeah. quick question as well. Um, uh, with the uh, settlement agreement, if it passes uh, tonight, Mr. Helfenberger, uh, will the developer uh, receive a full uh, certificate of occupancy for the facility uh, unrestricted? Yep. Yes. Okay. Anything else? Uh, Mayor? Yes. Make sure that our record's clear. The, um, the provisions in the rent advance and refund agreement will not repay the million dollars. It may repay the $4 million that the city will advance, but it will not repay the million dollars as stated. And the one month delay, it was actually a five month, approximately five month based on the records of the um, city. So I wanna make sure that our record is clear. Nonetheless, uh, I think that the city manager recommends the uh, resolution or partial settlement. The um, last thing is that Mr. Helfenberger is the is the uh, final CO actually do it on this, or is it due at the time that the liens are taken care of? There are nine or eight liens on the property. Okay. Well, that was my that was my point for that question. I mean, you can they're gonna give us seventy five thousand, give the city seventy five thousand dollars back, and we and, and the taxpayers gonna pay them a million dollars. No, that's not right. And I won't, I won't agree to it. Anybody else? All right, let's try to speak on the roll, please. Mr. Green? Yes. Ms. Moses? Yes. Mr. Jefferson? Yes. Mr. Hill? No. Mayor Witt? Yes. Okay, we'll move to <clears throat> City Council Resolution Number 2020-072. Uh, Mr. Cover, did you read that by title? Yes, sir. Just a moment, please. A resolution of City Council of City of Lake City, Florida, ratifying the mayor's extension of the state of emergency arising from the COVID-19 public health emergency period. There's a motion as to the City Council Resolution 2020-072. I move for the adoption of resolution 2020-072. Second. And a motion and a second. Any discussion? Ms. Oxford, call the roll, please. Ms. Moses? Yes. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Jefferson? Yes. Mr. Hill? Yes. Mayor Witt? Yes. Next to City Council Resolution 2020-075. Everyone, to read that by A resolution of City Council of City of Lake City, Florida, accepting the bid from Abacon Incorporated for the purchase and installation of one 20,000 gallon Jet A fuel tank system and authorizing the city to execute an agreement with the contract. Period. Is there a motion of City Council Resolution 2020 075? Mr. Mayor, I would move for the adoption of Resolution 2020 075. Second. second. And a motion and a second. Any discussion? Ms. Dykes, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Green? Yes. Moses? Yes. Mr. Jefferson? Yes. Mr. Hill? Yes. Mayor Witt? Yes. Okay, that <clears throat> completes the resolutions. Next is item C, which is discussion and possible action Rotary Club Christmas Parade. Tentatively scheduled for Saturday, December the 12th. 
and I guess that's up for us to discuss. And one thing that just occurred to me is that but the way school is and all, I guess they haven't mentioned anything about a homecoming parade this year. Is that correct? I think that's not even a an issue. Okay. So this would be the first one that first parade that would be there. What's the uh discussion of council on this? Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Mr. Green. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I would support the Rotary Club's uh, efforts to hold the Christmas parade. I think it's a personal choice and uh, personal responsibility uh, for everyone as to whether or not they want to uh, participate or attend. Uh, but uh, I would support the Rotary Club if uh, they endeavor to uh, hold the parade. I think the Rotary Club is looking at um, some other alternatives. Um, because they see the, you know, the way things are going with um, the coronavirus and um, hopefully by December it'll be better, but we don't know that. And they're looking at with, you know, with when they're no longer playing football games and, and canceling all that, you know, looking at a parade where you would be putting a bunch of children on a parade and, you know, and a bunch of people on the sidelines. I think they've looked at, the Rotary Club I know has looked at alternate things that they could do with the money to have a community sort of activity that would, you know, lend itself better to the safety factors with coronavirus. But, um, you know, they did not make a decision about whether they would have it or not. Ms. Ms. Moses, is, is your understanding that the Rotary Club uh, would rather not have the parade then and do something else? Is that, uh, I've, I've not spoken to anyone in Rotary uh, on the topic, but uh, is that your understanding? My understanding is that they were looking at alternate things, that they were thinking that there's a good possibility, you know, with so many other things being canceled, so many other, you know, large activities being canceled, that there's a good possibility that this would be also. So they were looking at other, um, alternatives to do with the money and and still have some sort of community project but they I mean I don't think anything's written in stone and and uh, I think you know they but there was a level of concern uh, yeah, we're, we're at August and uh, I can't imagine that this is a drop dead time uh, so I would I guess get Mr. Helfenberger to get with them and see what their plans are and I'd like to know when their last date they could make this decision because like we said it, it could be better by then they may have a different alternative or something but i think at this point i'd hate to see us deny it or even approve it mm -hmm. without more information and, and i think it's so early in the thing that uh, i think that we need to get a little bit more I, okay. I agree mr mayor i think uh uh i'd like to know exactly what uh you know what the rotary club wishes uh, whether or not they wish to have the parade. So uh, I, I think uh, delay in uh, letting Mr. Helfenberger uh, reach out to him is a good plan. Okay, is everybody good with that? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, we'll do that. Uh, next is Departmental Administration. Mr. Helfenberger, you got anything? Uh, yes, I wanted to give get back to you on the monument. Uh, I've been in touch with, uh, and I'm looking at about five different parties as far as possible relocation of the monument. Uh, I, I'm in negotiation uh, with, with some of them at this point, looking to uh, have something back to the council as soon as possible. Uh, we, uh, there, there's uh, possibilities of, of, uh, of property in and around the cemetery that might work, uh, but I don't have anything at this point confirmed. Uh, but I expect to have something in the very near future. Uh, and everybody, the, the parties seem to be willing to, to negotiate, so we'll see what we come up with. Uh, are there any, basically uh, a lot of it's in negotiations right now. Uh, also, we had uh, a request, it was maybe a couple of council meetings ago to urge uh, our 
citizens to uh, properly social distance. And uh, I would strongly urge that if, if they're not able to have the six foot separation, mm -hmm. uh, that they would be wearing masks or that, you know, we would, for example, if somebody comes into the city and they, they need a mask, we would have it available. Uh, we have a policy with the city employees that they need to wear masks whenever they can't social distance. I had one violation of that that was uh, talked to and, and will be corrected. Uh, but uh, I think that to protect the most vulnerable people in our community, uh, wearing the mask will be extremely helpful. It may not be a matter of life and death for some people, but it is for others. And uh, I, I think anything we can do to, uh, to uh, get this to keep the numbers low on the, on the COVID-19 is, is helpful, at least until we can get come up with a, a vaccine. I have comments and counsel. Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. I have a couple of questions uh, um, for Mr. Helfenberger. Uh, were we able to, uh, have we done any work on determining park ownership? Uh, have we reached out to the county to determine if uh, a quick claim deed uh, would suffice for uh, clearing up any uh, uh, misunderstandings on that? Where are we at with park ownership uh, for okay. Olympic Park? Uh, the, uh, the legal research is showing that the entity that's doing the title search uh, for the park is recommended doing a survey. So we've asked to have that proceed as soon as possible. Uh, we don't have uh, a final determination on the ownership of either the park or the monument. Uh, it, there is uh, talking to uh, county administration, it looks like there is uh, interest in uh, potentially quit claiming the deed to the, a deed to the city for the park ownership. Uh, also, uh, I've had a, uh, uh, a county supervisor reach out to me and help to try to uh, find a location for uh, relocating the monument. For the uh, park, park ownership, uh, Mr. Helfenberger, is there a, uh, a time frame when we would, uh, uh, stop researching and, and move ahead with the quit claim deed? Um, I would uh, it, it's, I would ask the, uh, the county staff, uh, I will send them a formal letter. I've had some informal conversations uh, asking them to, to do that. Super, and then um, I know uh, when we had our special meeting, we were talking about the uh, federal benchmark uh, options. Uh, uh, have you been able to uh, make any headway on, uh, on that or do you need some direction from the council on the federal benchmark issue? Okay, what they need is if we would, if we would uh, be able to use, uh, they have a service that, uh, that would help with that that's related, that's through the, uh, the state uh, we could actually get them to help relocate it for, for free or near, nearly free, but uh, it would be about two months before they would be able to do the work and they would have to do some, some surveying prior to relocating the monument. If we want to relocate it sooner than two months, we would need to use a different service. But whatever we do, if we're going to move the monument and the, the, uh, uh, the, the geodetic, the US uh, National Geodetic Survey staff was telling me that they've got to take survey measurements before they move the monument in order to be able to place the um, marker uh, correctly after it's moved. And they also advised that you could take that existing marker with the monument, you don't have to worry about having the exact same marker, but uh, they would, some of the, there's state agencies that would come in with, with the uh, required equipment to have the highest level of accuracy. And if we could wait two months, they would do it uh, for, uh, for free or nearly free. I understand. 
Uh, so we're looking at uh, two months on uh, the federal benchmark. Uh, do you need a uh, consensus of the council uh, to, to move ahead with that? Um, that would help. If you want me to get the alternative uh, quotes for, for surveying, uh, it was estimated at six to $8,000 for this uh, highest level of accuracy, I can do so. Uh, otherwise, if, if the two months is satisfactory to, to move it, uh, then uh, we can work with the, the state and, and no need to get the other quotes. So I, I, I would, I would uh, be curious as to uh, what my colleagues think. Well, I think it's going to take us a while to get the ownership for the county to do theirs. I think we're going to be way into two months because we still got to negotiate with these people, we got to find out what the cost and all are. So I think right now, if we just keep getting information, can we actually know exactly where we're going and what we're doing? Well, what I could do also is I could I could still just get those other uh, quotes and then uh, you'd have them in case we were able to do things sooner. Right. I, I know for me, Mr. Mayor, uh, if the council uh, decides to take that, uh, uh, final vote once we move through these steps. Uh, uh, you know, you definitely don't want a uh, large delay once we vote. We want to be able to act uh, if, uh, as soon as that vote takes place. So I want to do as much legwork as possible on the front end. Okay. I'll get the survey quotes. Um, and then uh, the uh, last thing that I had, Mr. Helfenberger, is uh, for, uh, I, I had asked about the uh, CO for the Blanche, um, and then I believe that the attorney had uh, questioned whether or not we were going, uh, going to issue the CO uh, uh, now, or if we were going to wait for uh, some of the lawsuits to be cleared up. Uh, where, what's, what's your take on that? Uh, I would personally prefer that we wait until the, the liens are cleared up, uh, because that's further, uh, that gives the city further leverage. Okay, and and has uh, has Mr. Holmes been made aware of that, or does he have a different expectation? Um, I do not know, but I can check with him. Mr. Green, sir, I asked for the clarification from the city manager because I understood it to be the opposite. Mr. Holmes has signed an agreement where a CO will not be issued until all the liens, whether they are currently bonded by insurance company or the $1 million lien by the general contractor until those are removed and lifted from the property. So, so Mr. Holmes has signed the agreement saying that he knows he's not going to receive a permanent CO uh, until he's uh, cleared up the liens? That is, on, yes, sir. That is on page four of 100. I'm sorry, that is in paragraph four on page 154 of our agenda packet and his signature is at the bottom of that agreement, which starts at page 157 of your agenda pack. Outstanding, as, as long as uh, we are all on the same page, that's, uh, uh, I just wanted to clear it up. So that, that makes it clear for me. Anything else? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Back to the monument here. Uh, Mr. Heffenberger, you mentioned that, uh, I believe you said you had about five possibilities. And I was wondering, um, was the uh, old Lester Battlefield considered as one of those possibilities since there are both state and federal property there? That is, but I, ha I do not know uh, how that is gonna turn out yet. Uh, yeah, okay. Well. I just wanted to know whether or not they was included as one of those possibilities. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Mayor. That's Mayor. all right. Yes. Do we need to take any action relating to the CDBG? Uh, she had asked for guidance. Is that something that we have to take formal action on tonight, or was that just a discussion only item? I don't know. <clears throat> Ms. Garrett had requested to speak again. Okay. Hi, um, yes, I, I actually, I was hoping that, um, that there would be a motion to authorize planning council staff uh, to work with city staff to develop an economic development CDBG application. 
Okay, do we have a motion? So moved, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> I'll second it. Okay, so we got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Ms. Ox, you call the roll, please. Mr. Green? Yes. Mr. Jefferson? Yes. Moses? Yes. Mr. Hill? Yes. Mayor Witt? Yes. Uh, Lauren, uh, you said this was the first public meeting. When will the second one be? Um, uh, we were shooting for a second public hearing um, at the end of September. I think it's September 21st. Okay. All right. Can I just ask one quick question, Lauren? Sure. Is this this is the one with HACO, right? The economic. Yes. The, okay. Thank yes. you. All right. Anything else? Well, I appreciate it, everybody. I think we're getting better at this. Uh, I think the Zoom is better, and uh, it's worked a lot better for us. But uh, I want to thank everybody and the staff for working to make these uh, as doable as we can. With that, we will be adjourned.